This is Jimmy Rogers, musician, singer, writer, TV and movie star. He has 23 gold records and 40 top 10 hits, plus four gold albums with such records as Honeycomb, Kisses Sweeter Than Wine, Uh-Oh, I'm Falling in Love Again, and many, many more. During the 50s and 60s, Jimmy Rogers was on top of the recording world. No doubt the sky was the limit and he was on his way to becoming one of the greats, such as Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, and yes, even Elvis. But on December the 1st, 1967, the unthinkable happened. In the middle of the night, he was pulled over by a so-called off-duty Los Angeles policeman. Beaten with an object such as an iron tire tool for no apparent reason and left in his car for dead, unable to walk or remember or speak. For years, the question was, why? Years later, it was discovered through FBI surveillance that the recording company that had helped make Jimmy famous was connected to the New York Genovese crime family. When he learned that his record company, Roulette Records, had no intention of paying him or anyone else their royalties, he did what other roulette artists were scared to do. He walked out on roulette and its mob-connected boss. James Frederick Rogers was born September the 18th, 1933, in Camas, Washington. Jimmy was the youngest son of Archie and Mary Rogers. He had one older brother, Archie Jr., that was born January the 1st, 1929. He was called Buster, or sometimes just bus for short. The Georgia Pacific pubwood mill was the dominant industry in Camas. Both Archie and Mary worked there. Mary also taught piano lessons and she had passed the love of music on to her youngest son. During the silent movie era, Mary had played piano to silent movies. And in those days, being able to do that was almost being like a celebrity itself. As far as Jimmy's daddy, Archie, was concerned, he was called Tuffy, and he lived up to his name. The only advice he ever gave his son was, keep your right hand high and your ass off the floor. And like an obedient son, that's what he tried to do. The boys grew up in this house, located at 725 Northwest 10th Avenue in Camas, Washington. In 2013, the street name was changed from 10th Avenue to Jimmy Rogers Avenue to honor the hometown singer. This is Jimmy and his brother Buss as teenagers. In 1951, Jimmy graduated from Camas High School. By this time, even his classmates realized that Jimmy Rogers had a great singing voice and Jimmy knew what he wanted to do in life. Like other high school classmates, he enrolled at Clark Junior College in Vancouver. He even worked at the Pubwood Mill for a while just to make enough money to go to college. After trying college, Rogers became restless and things just wasn't moving fast enough. So Jimmy joined the Air Force and in 1952, the Korean War was going strong. And during wartime, being a good shot was imported and it soon became apparent that Jimmy Rogers was a good shot. He grew up with guns, so eventually the Air Force gave him a job of training others how to shoot. Jimmy will end up in Korea, although they tell you don't worry you're in the Air Force and won't be on the front lines. They forget to say everything in Korea is on the front line, like the time he decided to skip mess, something that he hardly ever did, and that night the enemy slipped across the flight line and killed several airmen as they were eating. Things like that was a constant reminder of where he was at. After returning stateside, he was assigned to Seward Air Force Base, located 20 miles southeast of Nashville, Tennessee. While there, he met Bob Green and his wife, Bobby. They were owners of a small club at the end of Printer's Alley called Club Unique. Jimmy began playing the piano and singing on the weekends 
for $10 per night. The Greens suggested a song that they thought was perfect for Jimmy's style and voice. Honeycomb had been written by Bob Merle in 1954. He was a noted songwriter in Nashville. Jimmy performed his own arrangements of Honeycomb and began playing it often. Everyone loved the song, but all he could do was sing it wherever he was performing. In March 1956, Jimmy's enlistment was up and back to Camas he went. After he arrived home, he soon heard of a girl that was a local beauty who was becoming a movie star. Her name was Colleen McClatchy. She had already appeared in several unaccredited movie roles. The Great Man, starring Josie Farrell, written on the wind with Rock Hudson. The Tennessee Plowboy, Eddie Arnold, and Francis in the Haunted House that starred Mickey Rooney. Universal Studios always started out their potential stars with a bit unaccredited roles. Now, Colleen's mother ran a cleaning shop in downtown Camas, and by chance Jimmy stopped by one afternoon, and Colleen happened to be there. She had returned from California to visit her folks. They agreed to meet for coffee. That started it all, and soon was in love, and spending as much time together as they could, between Jimmy playing in different nightclubs and Colleen having to go back and forth to Hollywood, time together was precious. On May the 12th, 1956, Jimmy was performing at the Fort Cafe in Vancouver. Colleen was attending a dance in Seattle as an honorary guest set up by the studio. Colleen and Jimmy had been inseparable for the past 10 days. It was after midnight before Colleen and a friend was able to leave the dance. Colleen was a passenger, and the cars in those days had no seat belts. During the early morning fog, an elderly couple pulled across the main road in front of her car. Her head struck the steel dashboard. Her face was crushed. She'll go through numerous surgeries, taking several months to restore her face. She will look the same outside, but will have severe headaches that in time, after several years, will cause her to become depressed and demobilized. When Universal Studios heard about the wreck, within four weeks, they had canceled her contract. While Jimmy was still performing at the Fort Cafe, waiting for Colleen's bandages to be removed after several surgeries, Chuck Miller was performing at the Frontier Room directly across the street. Chuck had already had a hit record, House of Blue Lights. They would sometimes visit each other's show, call it friendly competition. But despite the competition, Jimmy and Miller became friends, and Miller was instrumental in getting an audition for Jimmy at Roulette Records in New York City. He also advised Jimmy and Colleen to get married and get on with their life. On 4 January 1957, they took Chuck Miller's advice and got married. When you're in love, big weddings take too long. Jimmy had won several talent contests during his career, like the one while he was in the Air Force and got to travel to several Air Force bases performing. He had appeared on the Art Link Letter Show and several national network shows, but still no recording deal. With Chuck Miller's help and encouragement and some doing, it was hoped a meeting could be set up with Roulette Records. Even though Colleen was still having headaches, she was ready to travel across country. She had given up on her career, and now it was Jimmy's that she was interested in. When they arrived in New York, they stayed in a low-rent hotel because money was scarce he was finally able to meet with some people at Roulette Records and sang a few songs, but nothing definite came out of it. In Jimmy's autobiography book, giving full details of his life called Dancing on the Moon, he relates how quite by accident, he and Nerves of Steel got on the Arthur Godfrey show. Walking down the street from Roulette Records, he saw a sign that said, Arthur Godfrey Talent Scouts. He tells how he walked in with other performers with his name not even on the talent list and bluffed his way in. He ended up winning the contest 
that he wasn't even supposed to be in. The prize was $750 and a week of appearing on the Odd for Godfrey national TV show. While appearing on Godfrey that week, Roulette Records called him to come in and do a demo. After recording Honeycomb, the song that Bob and Bobby Green had introduced him to, he felt good about the recording, but no one at the record company said a thing to him. So he walked back to the hotel where Colleen was staying, and they decided to take the $750 that he had won as prize for the Godfrey show and head back to Camus while they still had enough money to get back on. It was a few weeks later on July the 29th, 1957, when Jimmy and his dad was planning on going fishing, as they had many times before. Here they are on one of their early fishing trips. Now, Jimmy had parked his car in the driveway and was intending on washing the dust off before they left. He had the car radio on, and when the radio started to play Honeycomb, Jimmy couldn't believe it. That was him singing. He ran to tell his folks who were also in disbelief. The announcer stated that if anybody knew this Jimmy Rogers to get in touch with the radio station as the recording company had lost touch with him. Honeycomb sold one million copies, was on the top of the charts for four straight weeks, number one on the R&B bestseller chart, and number one Billboard Top 100, and became Jimmy Rogers' first gold record. After Honeycomb, his career was like a whirlwind. Gold records followed one after another, Kisses Sweeter Than Wine, Uh-Oh, I'm Falling in Love Again, he sang the title song to the movie Long Hot Summer with Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward, Orson Welles, and Lee Remick. The song was a hit, along with seven consecutive hits that year. Jimmy even performed at the Academy Awards. He had been a part of the Alan Freed Rock and Roll Tour, along with Buddy Holly and the Crickets. Later, he'll tour with the Everly Brothers, Danny and the Juniors, Little Richard, and many, many more. In August of 1958, Colleen was able to meet Jimmy in Atlantic City, where he was playing. She seemed to be doing some better, away from her nurses and doctors that would prescribe her pain medication at the drop of a hat. While taking a walk along the shore, she seemed to be at herself and asked Jimmy when he had spoke with his parents. You should call him, she said. He didn't know that it would be the last time he'd be able to speak with his dad. Jimmy's mother was still working at the mill, and his dad would be doing a lot of fishing. Jimmy told him to be careful out there on the lake by himself. And he told Jimmy that somebody was going with him, but they must have never arrived because Jimmy received a phone call from his brother Archie. Their father, Archie Sr., had drowned in Fallen Leaf Lake. His rubber raft had sank. Family was devastated. Jimmy and Bus stayed with their mother a few days as Colleen stayed with her parents. Archie Rogers was 58 years old. The press was everywhere. Making this private time for the Rogers family was almost impossible. Soon after Mr. Rogers' passing, Ralph Edwards surprised Jimmy for an episode on This Is Your Life, a coast-to-coast -coast television show. Now here is Ralph Edwards standing on the left with Jimmy's brother Buss next to him and singer Chuck Miller that helped Jimmy get an interview with Roulette Records. Next to him is David Walker who helped teach Jimmy to play the guitar. And the lady next to David Walker is Bobby Green who along with her husband Bob owned the club Unique in Nashville and found the song Honeycomb for Jimmy. Next is Sergeant Brown, a friend from the Air Force. The next two are producers from Roulette Records. Sitting is Jimmy's mom, Mary, Jimmy, and Colleen. In 1959, NBC placed Jimmy on a short-lived TV show. This is a publicity photo of Jimmy, Colleen, and his mother. Jimmy said in his book, Dancing on the Moon, that the men from NBC looked at me and said, the only thing that could stop us from keeping your show on the network is this new show called Gunsmoke. 
but it won't take your place. We're sure of that. It turned out to be okay because not long after Jimmy's show was canceled, his agent gave him a movie script from 20th Century Fox called The Little Shepherd of Kingdom Come. Jimmy was picked to play the lead, an orphan who fights for the North during the Civil War and returns to his girlfriend in Kentucky. Jimmy's co-star was Luanna Patton with Chill Wills and Robert Dix. The movie was not expected to be released until a year or so later in 1961. In 1960, Jimmy decided to make a change. Marsh Levy, with his mob connections, controlled Roulette Records, and Roulette Records owed Jimmy over a million dollars in back royalties. Jimmy wasn't the only artist that Roulette Records owed royalties to, but he was the biggest moneymaker at that time, and no one was sure what the mob might do if Jimmy left. They produced contracts that he had never signed, and people would call him at home in the middle of the night and say, I saw you sign that contract, and then hang up. To fight him in court was useless considering their connections. Regardless of the consequences, Jimmy had his dad's fighting spirit and left Morris Levy and Roulette Records with two years left on his contract. He'll not be able to record anywhere for the next two years. In the meantime, he was busy promoting The Little Shepherd of Kingdom Come and doing personal appearances. Jimmy knew that his wife was spending more and more time with his co-star while he was working, but he was carrying the weight of a movie on his shoulders and thought that the little flirtations were innocent. After filming of The Little Shepherd of Kingdom Come was over, he knew Colleen was spending more time in her bedroom and seemed depressed. Jimmy thought it was because she was five months pregnant and, of course, there was always the terrible headaches. On Christmas Eve, 1960, he wasn't ready to hear what Colleen told him. She said that she was in love with another man, and as soon as the baby was born, she was leaving. Jimmy was in shock and disbelief. He thought of leaving and moving out of the house, but he knew that if he left, Colleen would not be able to take care of herself if left alone. He also knew that the fly by night actor had no idea how sick Colleen really was. He knew he had to put his own pride aside for her sake. Again, Pop Rogers' fighting spirit came through. Damned if he was going to lose his family to someone just passing through. And this time, it was another ass that was going to hit the floor. It wouldn't be Jimmy's. After confronting the actor, he was no longer a threat. Colleen will forget in time, and life will go on. On April the 14th, 1960, Jimmy was on stage at the Cave Supper Club in Vancouver, British Columbia. The waitresses were all waiting on word, and when it came, they held up a sign for Jimmy to see. It said, It's a girl, Michelle Colleen Rogers. Michelle was a sweet blessing to Jimmy and his little family. By 1962, Jimmy's contract with Roulette Records was over, and now he could look for another record company. He found it with Dot Records, where he could record and produce and sit behind a desk, giving him a chance to stay close to home. The next year, 1963, Colleen was pregnant with Michael. Now this is Colleen, Michelle, and Michael. She tried to stay off medications as much as her pain would allow, while pregnant, and she had spent most of her time in bed. Even at that, Michael James Rogers was born four early at four pounds and nine ounces on the 24th of June, 1963. The Rogers family was living at 16937 Lawwood Drive in Granada Hills, an upscale community northwest of Los Angeles. They were living the life of a world entertainer, swimming pools, three automobiles, housekeepers, gardeners, and all the rest that goes with it. However, not long after Michael was born, Jimmy came home to find Colleen had gotten worse. She was seeing things that weren't there. The doctor found a large blood clot on her brain, causing her delusion and severe headaches. 
the calls most likely from her automobile wreck before they were married. She needed immediate surgery, and she will need other surgeries later and will never fully recover, partly because of her initial injury and partly from unqualified surgeons. Colleen's mother came to live with them to help look after Colleen and the children. Eventually, Colleen's dead and her younger brother came also. Jimmy was mostly on the road working, paying bills. In 1964, Rogers made one of several tours to Australia. Here he is in a publicity picture at the Mascot Airport after just arriving from a long flight with the singing group The Crystals. Now, The Crystals was a Brooklyn gal group that had several hits, such as He's a Rebel, When He Kissed Me, and That Do Run Run. He was surprised when he learned that 20th Century Fox wanted him again for another movie. And this one is entitled Back Door to Hell. It was to be a war film, and it meant spending a month filming in the Philippines. He was to star alongside two newcomers, Jack Nicholson and Buddy Hackett. The money was good, but it meant being away from home. According to Jimmy's book, Dancing on the Moon, Leaving little Michelle and Michael was a heartbreaking event. Even returning home and seeing them hanging on to his legs and looking up with so much love made leaving even to pay bills and keep things going for everyone much harder. When a dad leaves home, usually the mother takes up the slack while he's gone. But when the mother is unable to even care for herself, it becomes almost impossible. The one thing Jimmy regretted was not caring enough to always be there. He knew that Colleen would always be taken care of by her parents. He also knew there was nothing that he could do really to make her well. It soon became apparent his only worth was to work and keep money coming in. And the only saving grace to that was knowing that Michael and Michelle were benefiting. In 1965, Jimmy Rogers was on television singing a jingle advertising spaghetti to the tune of, Uh-oh, I'm Falling in Love Again. While he was still under contract to Dot Records, he was asked to tour with Herb Albert and the Tijuana Brass. The Lonely Bull was at the top of the charts. Jimmy said that while the band was performing at Carnegie Hall in New York, he saw a girl standing outside the stage door crying. She told him her boyfriend was a member of the band and had just broken up with her, and it was over. Jimmy went back to his hotel room and wrote and recorded, It's Over. It's Over in 1967 was recorded by Glenn Kimball, Dusty Springfield, Roy Orbison, and yes, in 1972, even Elvis recorded it. Later, as It's Over was coming off the charts, Jimmy's contract with Dot Records was also over. He then moved on to A&M Records, where it wasn't long before he was back on the charts again with Child of Clay. Here he is performing Child of Clay on the Smothers Brothers show in 1967. On November 30th, 1967, Jimmy called his good friend, also his music arranger and conductor, Eddie Samuels, now, Samuels had worked for years for Eddie Fisher, but he became friends with Jimmy, and they worked well together, and Rogers felt comfortable with Samuels conducting. According to Jimmy's autobiography, Dancing on the Moon, he asked Samuels to meet him downtown that afternoon. Jimmy said they went to actor Bob Colbert's home and played music for a while, and then all three went to a boutique where he bought Christmas gifts for Colleen. From there, they went to the China Trade Bar and Restaurant, where another friend of theirs, actor Bob Troop, and occasionally his wife, Julie London, was playing. Jimmy had dinner there and sang a few songs with Eddie playing piano. While there, they met some people that they really didn't know and was invited to their home in the valley for a Christmas party. Around 2 a.m. on the morning of December the 1st, Jimmy and Eddie left the party going home. Jimmy was in his car, and Eddie was following in his at a distance. Eddie was planning on spending the night at Jimmy's house. While traveling north on the San Diego freeway, 
Across the still sleepy San Fernando Valley, there was almost no traffic stirring. Samuel stated that he caught up with Jimmy and was afraid that Jimmy was going to miss the Rinaldi turnoff. According to Eddie Samuels, he knew that Jimmy had been drinking and he was driving in the far left lane. Now, Jimmy never denied that he had a few drinks at the party and accepted full responsibility for his drinking that night. However, it should be pointed out, unlike other show business personalities, Jimmy Rogers was never caught up in the drug scene. He wasn't much of a drinker. So Eddie Samuels pulled in front of Jimmy's car and turned on his blinker to remind Jimmy to turn off. Jimmy swerved his Cadillac and barely made the Rinaldi exit. But Eddie was too busy wondering about Jimmy, he missed the exit and went to the next one and drove on to Jimmy's house to wait on him. Jimmy remembered going down the ramp and sitting at the bottom of the ramp to clear his head. He then turned left on Subhovita. At the stoplight, Jimmy turned left on West Rinaldi. After traveling under the freeway, Suddenly, a car pulls up behind him, shining their bright lights and blinking them. Jimmy began pulling over to the right side of Rinaldi. He stops and rolls down the driver's side window, thinking that it might be his friend, Eddie Samuels. As someone walked up to the window, Jimmy realizes that he had just been struck on the head by what seemed to be an iron tire tool. Now, the doctor said that Jimmy was struck several times about the head with something very hard like an iron rod. He had a broken wrist, which seemed to be defensive blows. The doctor said the blows to the head was hard enough to have killed him. Jimmy went in and out of consciousness. He remembered being on the ground. He remembered seeing shoes and black pants legs of what appeared to be policemen. He remembered someone saying, Damn, Duffy. You've killed this man. He remembered laying in the front seat of his car alone, unable to move or focus, not knowing how bad he was hurt and not knowing how much time had passed. Eddie Samuels had been waiting at Jimmy's house, and when he didn't show, he went looking for him. Driving east on Rinaldi, he spotted Jimmy's car and saw a police car and a white Volkswagen pulling away. Eddie drove on past and did a U-turn around and came back. He left his car and drove Jimmy's home. He had found Jimmy in the front seat of his car bleeding. Rogers was later taken to the Glendale Community Hospital on recommendation of his family doctor. It was discovered that Jimmy had a blood clot and on the 5th of December he was operated on. The right side of his head was left exposed. Jimmy began having grand mal seizures. On the 9th of December, he will begin bleeding and have to have another emergency brain surgery. Jimmy will eventually go through three major surgeries and numerous cosmetic surgeries. He will lose the ability to walk or speak. He will be bedridden for almost two years. After being moved from Glendale Hospital to a private hospital for therapy, a male nurse named Ray Wacko was placed completely in charge of Rogers' rehabilitation. Wacko told everybody to stay away, even his wife and family. Jimmy was helpless under Wacko's control. He was keeping Jimmy doped up and sleeping most of the time. He was losing weight, even down to 118 pounds. Wacko received the insurance pay as long as his patient couldn't get out of bed and that seemed to be Wacko's game. Jimmy didn't know how long he was there, but one evening, Colleen showed up and demanded to take him home. In her condition, it must have took every bit of energy she could muster. Unfortunately, when she got home, she went back into her shell. And to make things worse, Wacko came along. Colleen's parents stayed in their part of the house and left everything up to Wacko. Wacko's attempt to keep Jimmy bedridden was actually slowly killing him. Jimmy could not help himself or get out of bed. If he got where he could think clear, Wacko would give him another shot, and back in Wacko land he'd go. Jimmy would cry out when he could, but to no avail. However, he didn't know, but he did have someone hearing his cries, his seven-year-old daughter, Michelle. 
Wacko had given orders, no visitors. Jimmy's friend, Bob Colbert, had called several times to ask about Jimmy. He was always told that Jimmy couldn't have any visitors and was either sleeping or resting. While Jimmy was at a place of recuperation and therapy, Bob didn't worry so much. But when it continued after he was brought home, he felt something was wrong. In the late part of February 1968, Bob Colbert went to see for himself. When the door opened, Bob was surprised to see Jimmy's little seven-year-old daughter, Michelle, standing there. And before he could say a word, Michelle said, The man is hurting my daddy. When Bob asked what man, she said, The nurse man is hurting my daddy. I can hear my daddy crying. This, along with the refusal to let Bob see Jimmy, was enough to convince him to call Jimmy's brother Archie at home in Washington State. He knew that Colleen was ill and could be no help. Archie called and was told that Jimmy was resting and couldn't talk. Archie caught the next plane for California. When he showed up at the door, they couldn't keep him from seeing his brother. Archie was shocked when he saw his brother Jimmy. He looked like a skeleton, 118 pounds, unshaven, unkept, couldn't turn over. His head was sunk in on one side and held together with wire. Jimmy managed to tell his brother without his mother-in-law and Wacko being able to hear, Archie, they're trying to kill me. Archie believed him. Jimmy said that he found out later, to his surprise, that Wacko was still alive. Archie had let him live after all. After Wacko was dismissed by Archie with prejudice, things began to improve. During this time, the papers was having a field day. At first, it was covered as another singing idol caught driving drunk, wrecking, and almost killing himself. When they learned that the police was somehow involved, the papers demanded that the Los Angeles Police Department investigate, even though they didn't want to. It was soon learned that an off-duty police officer by the name of Raymond or Michael Duffy was the one that stopped Jimmy's car. Duffy's statement was that Jimmy was driving southbound on the northbound side of the freeway. He pulled over and waited for Jimmy to do a U-turn and come back and pass him by. He followed Jimmy on to Rinaldi and pulled him over by flashing his lights. Duffy's story was that he asked Jimmy to get out and walk back to his car. At that time, Jimmy fell backwards and must have hit his head on something, he said. The two on-duty cops that was called said that they never even seen Jimmy, that Duffy told them that he was in his car sleeping it off on the front seat. They entered on their logs that the subject had already left by the time they arrived. They later admitted falsifying their logs. Duffy, being off duty, needed a good excuse for legally stopping someone just for making a rolling stop through a stop sign. That wasn't good enough, but stopping someone going the wrong way on the freeway was. The police department, knowing there'd be a lawsuit coming, began closing ranks to protect Duffy and the on-duty cops, Roland Wagner and Raymond Wiseman. The question in Jimmy's mind was why. What had he done that was so bad that would cause police officers to leave him for dead and try and hide the fact that they was even there? Was this just a rogue cop that loved to beat people to death and just went around in the middle of the night looking for a victim, knowing that he had the protection of the department? Or was he a paid assassin from the mob-connected roulette records? It was well known that when a singer dies, his popularity increases and record sales skyrocket, and Roulette controlled the majority of Jimmy Rogers' hit recordings. In 1988, the FBI helped convict Morris Levy, president of Roulette Records, and mob connected to the Genevieve crime family, to 10 years in prison. He was convicted of conspiracy and showed that he had no qualms of having someone beat up or worse. However, Levy will pass away from liver cancer at the age of 62 before his sentence starts. Singer, songwriter, and producer Tommy James, who was under contract to Roulette Records and who knew better than to leave Morris Levy until years later when things were safe. J. 
James was famous for the songs Hanky Panky, Crimson and Clover, and many others. He wrote in his book, Me, the Mob, and the Music, that Mars Levy had instigated the hit on Jimmy Rogers. He even stated at a book signing interview, if you cross Levy, you could end up like Jimmy Rogers, left for dead on the L.A. freeway. James also said top L.A. police officials was mob-connected along with the Los Angeles Medical Examiner's Office. This might help explain why the attending physician told Rogers' family that he was beat with a possible iron rod, and a few weeks later the medical examiner's office said no, he fell and hurt himself. Might also explain why the three policemen were only given a 15-day suspension for not following procedures instead of being arrested for malicious intent or attempted murder. By 1969, Jimmy was on the slow road to recovery. He'll even return to performing. There'll be many times he'll have to be helped on and off the stage. Even being extremely handicapped with seizures, not knowing when they might occur. Like when he was doing his last guitar solo at the Circle Star Theater in San Carlos, California. In the middle of the solo, he stopped playing and he just sat there in silence. His friend Eddie Samuels quietly took the guitar out of his hand and led him off stage to the roaring applause of the crowd. In 1970, Colleen's parents filed for divorce. I say her parents because she was not present at the divorce proceedings. Her mother seen to everything. Jimmy explained it this way. It's impossible to keep a marriage together during their combination of five brain surgeries. To keep the seizures to a minimum, he was prescribed 500 milligrams twice daily of dialentin. And of course, it makes almost impossible to function on that much medication. He had to be careful not to bump his head because of the steel plate he carried around on the right side of his head, thanks to L.A.'s finest. After his divorce, he naturally had to move out of the house to return only to see his kids. Jimmy spent the next few months trying to make the marriage work. He was up against a brick wall. He rented a place on Cliffwood Drive in Brentwood. He had to keep working in order to pay alimony and child support and bills. He began using a golf club as a walking stick to get on stage and sometimes put braces on his legs. Unbelievably, he began receiving threatening calls again. Jimmy said it was right out of the movies. If I were you, pal, I wouldn't leave the house. He started to call the police, but what if it was the police? Jimmy still had a lawsuit pending against the L.A. Police Department. He tried to ignore the threats, but one afternoon when he was on his way home, he had left his little 1963 Chevy Stingray sports car in the open garage. He arrived home to find the fire department trying to put the fire out. They arrived too late. No more sports car. Someone was making a point. Jimmy still wasn't safe. Whether it was the mob in New York or the police in L.A., to Jimmy it's all the same if you're on the receiving end. The lawsuit against the police department was still going on, but he was having a hard time keeping lawyers. They'd all start out saying, we're going to win this case, it'll be easy. A week later it would be, Jimmy, I'm not going to be able to handle your case, sorry. It was plain someone got to him. During this time, Jimmy met Trudy Buck, an airline stewardess and model, on a blind date. Within a few months, Jimmy and Trudy were married in Venice, California on the 1st of August, 1970. Trudy was 21 and Jimmy was 36. It was her first marriage and of course his second. They honeymooned at the Mona Key Hotel in Hawaii. She'll give up her job as a stewardess to become a supportive wife to her husband. On February the 17th, 1972, Jimmy and Trudy will have a son, Casey Williams Rogers. Jimmy was home when Casey was born. It was the first time that he was not on the road when the child was born. The next year in 1973, 
Jimmy's lawyer informed him that there was no way he was going to win a lawsuit against the Los Angeles Police Department. The lawsuit was finally settled after four years of one deposition after another. The police department offered a settlement because they didn't need the publicity a trial would bring. The next year, on July the 28th, 1974, Jimmy and Trudy's second son, Logan Andrew Rogers, was born. When Logan was three years old, Trudy and Jimmy separated in August of 1977 and divorced one year later on August the 14th, 1978. Jimmy took full responsibility, saying that he had put fame ahead of his marriage. Colleen McClatchy, Jimmy's first wife, had been rushed to the hospital for surgery. It was discovered that she had a blood clot on the brain, and that was the reason for the headaches all those years. Colleen, the beautiful would-be star, passed away from brain surgery on the 20th of May, 1977, at the age of 38. Although Jimmy and Colleen had been divorced for seven years, he had continued to support her care. During Jimmy Rogers' career, he continued to perform even though at times he wasn't able. His family was depending on him. He was in and out of the hospital several times trying to control his seizures. And once when his metal plate got dislodged and pushed through the scalp. Under these conditions, finding work was not easy. In 1978, Jimmy had been asked by the American Folk Ballet Touring Company to be their host to introduce different forms of dance. The troupe was making one-night stands with about 20 performers traveling from place to place in a bus. There was one dancer in particular, Mary Louise Biggerstaff. Jimmy said in his book that when Mary took the stage, lights went on, and for him, they stayed on. Jimmy and Mary married September the 10th, 1978. Jimmy was 45 and Mary was 25. Her 81-year-old grandmother kept asking, Mary, where did you get this nice young boy? Jimmy said, it's funny, Mary was a 25-year-old woman and I was a 45-year-old boy. Mary and Jimmy's family, along with a list of celebrities attended. His 15-year-old son, Michael, flew up from California. Jimmy said he would come up missing from time to time, and they'd find that he had sneaked into the casinos. It's been said that when a woman marries into a family, her attitude can become a blessing and raise the family up, or she can tear the family down. Mary was a blessing. After their wedding, Jimmy and Mary hit the road to pay off $80,000 worth of bills one show at a time. On October 31, 1989, Jimmy and Mary had a daughter, Katrine Elizabeth Rogers. Two years after Katrine was born, Jimmy and Mary moved to Branson, Missouri. They opened the Jimmy Rogers Family Theater. Mary and Jimmy's five kids all performed in the show. There was two shows a day, six days a week. Jimmy had been diagnosed with spasmodic dysphonia disorder, which made it hard for him to sing. He told his audience that he was singing along with his records, and they didn't care. All they wanted was to see and be close to Jimmy Rogers. The entire family loved their time together in Branson. Jimmy's last show in Branson was December 11, 2001. When they returned to California and gigs was few and far between. Mary taught dancing, which she loved, and did studio work. Jimmy painted apartments and repaired houses. He just wanted to stay busy. In 2012, Jimmy had a mild heart attack, but he put off open heart surgery so he could perform for a sellout crowd in his hometown of Camas. Jimmy and Mary Rogers have been married 41 years they both deserve happiness. Pop Rogers would have been proud of his son. Who else could have bucked up against the New York mob and fight the entire L.A. Police Department and still keep his right hand high and his ass off the floor? <laughs>